الحمد لله الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم ربنا آتنا من لدنك رحمة وهيئ لنا من أمرنا رشدا اللهم رب يسر ولا تعسر وتم بالخير بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم صدق الله صدق الله العلي العظيم وصدق رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين أما بعد الحمد لله all praises and thanks are due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing us to be here today to perform the Salatul Jumar and to listen to the khutbah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his peace and blessings onto the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'een we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon each and every one of us to shower his hidayah, his guidance upon us to shower his forgiveness upon us and to shower his acceptance upon us I once more ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower his rahmah, his mercy upon me by giving me the permission and the ability to deliver this khutbah inshallah I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance, I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's assistance, I seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness, and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower unto me the quality of tawakkal ala Allah, the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the taqwa, the piety, the iman, the faith, the hikmah, the wisdom, the ilm, the knowledge, and the ability to fulfill this responsibility in delivering the khutbah, inshallah. I put my tawakkal, I put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most sufficient. My brothers and sisters, alhamdulillah again and mashallah and bi'ithnillah and with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, over the past few weeks, we have been reminding ourselves on the state of Muslims in America, the present condition, the things that are happening around us, and you have been hearing that, you have been seeing that on the news, you're well updated in what ever has been happening, is happening. And I, 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 I don't really remember myself, but I think two weeks ago when we were here, the khutbah, the topic was Allah's plan is better than Trump's ban. So, and you would have seen things happen, and Allah has his way of doing things. But today, I want to get away from that whole political scenario that is happening because Allah's plan is better and Allah will make everything flow the right way and how Allah wants it to happen. And Allah always chooses the best for his creation. But the important point is we got to have that taqwa, do that duty to Allah, have that tawakkal, that trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
have that iman, that faith, do amil salihat do the righteous deeds, do what we have to do, we obey Allah, the politicians will do what they have to do, the lawyers will do what they have to do, that's how it runs. And we got to do what we have to do, inshallah. Today, I would like to remind myself and you a little bit about our lifestyle. The importance, the importance of us being more devoted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is important that we develop that. And unfortunately, sometimes I wonder if it's because, because we are not that 100% devoted to Allah, hence the Muslim world is facing such problems and consequences. You know, the Prophet وسلم, in a hadith, the synopsis of which is, there will be a time, there will be a time when the world will get together, or many a people will get together to attack the Muslims, to persecute the Muslims, to oppress the Muslims, to cause harm and difficulties to the Muslims. And I sometimes wonder if we are in that time. Wallahu alam, Allah knows best. And the Sahabas had asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they said, Ya Rasulullah, referring to when would that happen? How would that happen? Would we be in small, little in numbers? We have nothing. We would be nobody. We would be just a little number. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like, no, you will be great in numbers as we are today, one and a half billion. You'll be a powerful people. And look at the Muslims in the world today, powerful. They hold powerful positions. Muslims are very technological. Muslims are in the legal field. Muslims are in the medical field. Muslims are in the engineering field. Muslims are almost in every field you can think about. So the Prophet وسلم, said, yes, you would be a powerful people with a lot of powerful things but because of your love for the dunya because of your desire now and you always remember we have always mentioned this my brothers and sisters enjoying the good things in life is not a problem because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the good things in life for us to enjoy Allah has created these things for us. But when, when the Prophet Sallallahu speaks about our love and our desire for the dunya, he's referring to us putting the materialistic things in the world before Allah. And it's, it's not about worshipping Allah, obeying Allah, following the sunnah of Rasulullah, and enjoying the bounties of the world. But it's about putting Allah and the Rasul aside and running in this desire and this greed and being obsessed in this world and for this world. And that will make the Muslims weak. Because of their iman, their faith being weak, they will face these consequences. And wallahi, my brothers and sisters and the viewers who are viewing Al Hikmat TV and this khutbah live throughout the world, sometimes I want to believe this is the time. You know, when the Prophet Sallallahu spoke about a time will come when Islam will be like burning coals in the hands of someone, of a Muslim, people will find such difficulty in practicing Islam. Not that it's, it's difficult out there, but because our iman would be so weak that we will find Islam to be a difficulty. Not about the difficulties around us. It's because our iman will be so weak 
that we will find it difficult to practice Islam. And because we will find it difficult to practice Islam because of the weakness of our iman and faith, we will be faced with a lot of difficulties. Oh, that is very interesting. You know, we may have everything. And that's what the Muslims have today. Muslims are. Muslims have power, they run countries, they got wealth, they got technology, they got knowledge, they got diplomas, they got degrees, they got everything. But we still suffer a lot of consequences. And even right here in America. Every day Muslims are sort of a little scared of what new is going to happen, what new ban, what anti-Muslim scenario is going to take place. But not only in America, it's happening in a lot of countries. But because the media is very powerful in America, and because you hear a lot of CNN and Fox, as opposed to a lot of the other countries, you don't know what's happening in other countries, but there are a lot of things like this happening in other countries. A lot of anti-Islamic things happening. A lot of Muslims are facing a lot of difficulties. There are some other countries that do not want Muslims cannot preach Islam. Mm -hmm. So, we as Muslims need to look into our hearts, my brothers and sisters, really. We got to look into our hearts, look into our amal, look and see what are we not doing according to Quran and Sunnah, and why we are facing these consequences. It's an important time. And I, you know, I don't need to touch on the salah and the zakat and the fasting and the hajj. <clears throat> but sometimes, you know, as Muslims, if we just look at the basic five pillars, the basic five pillars, a very simple thing. The Prophet says, La yu'minu ahadukum hatta yahibbu liyakhihi ma yahibbu li nafsihi. You are not a true believer until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. On a line of iman, faith. You know, we all talk about we're Muslims and we are this Islam and we are that Islam and we are all Islam. But we don't even understand what it means to love for your brother what you love for yourself. Actually, a lot of us, what we love for ourselves, we hate that our brothers and sisters will have it. What am I saying? What we love for ourselves, we hate for our brothers and sisters to have it. And I don't mean, and I mean the good things. You want to have the best of everything, but you don't want anybody else to have that. Is that Iman? That's a simple branch of Iman. So sometimes because of that lack of Iman and the deterioration in our faith, just the basic pillars. I'm not getting to all the nine yards of Islam. Basic. You look around in the Muslim world, my brothers and sisters. How many Muslims really pray their salah on time? How many Muslims even pray their salah? Huh? You, you know, you look at it even in Juma. You know, I was not here last week. But I had Brother Tenry was telling me because the Imam finished the khutbah uh, on time. Let me don't say early. The Imam last week who did the khutbah, he finished on time. And there were people, almost a whole line who missed Salah. Interesting, huh? How you like that? <laughs> he finished on time. And there were over a whole line who missed Salah. That's why I go over time. I try to accommodate these people so they don't miss their Salah. But Allahu Akbar, how much are you going to stretch? That's one of the reasons why sometimes I drag the khutbah to accommodate the people who will fall in at 3.45. The imam finished last week at 2.35. A whole line of people miss Salah. So Muslims cannot even be for Salah on time. And Juma, which is once a week. Do you understand how bad the situation is? I've always said to myself and said to you, my brothers and sisters, that if you take the statistics of Muslims in a country, not even 10% praise Juma Salah. You go do the maths. I don't need to do it for you. You calculate how many mosques they got in America. 
How many Muslims they got in America? Three million plus. How many mosques and masajid they got in America? Two thousand plus. You check the mosques and the masajid and see how many people pray. Juma Salah. We're not even talking about the five times Salah. Because that you can pray home, you can pray in your own time, within a long time. You go from Zohar to Asr to pray in your job and at home. So, mashallah, we ain't talking about that. Got a lot of flexibility with that. But the Juma, and I've always used the statistics of South Florida, and I could, I could show that statistics in all other countries and states and places. You got 100,000, you know, people talk about 75,000 Muslims in South Florida. You got 30 to 40 masajid. You think every masjid got a thousand people? No. You got, you got us and three or four others that may have five and six, seven hundred people. The rest of them is just a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred, seventy-five, a hundred. No way that makes up half of the, the 75,000. Okay? No way. You go into other countries and look at their statistics of Muslims, the percentage of Muslims, the many masajid they got, and how many pray Juma. That tells us, and Juma, you know, I don't like to speak about Juma all the time, but Juma is a very testing line of evaluation for the Muslims. That's because the Prophet said if a person misses three Juma consecutively, he's on the line of kuf, disbelief. You know it was about Juma Salah that the Prophet told the Sahabas. He said, I, I wish I could appoint someone to lead the Salah and I will go and burn down the homes and the business places of the men who do not come for Juma. Come on, see how serious it is. He would appoint someone to lead Salah. And go and burn down the homes. But you know that was just his, his way of expressing how important it is. Not that he would burn down the homes. The Prophet ﷺ never even walked on an ant. On an ant. He never walked in an ant to hurt an ant. So he wouldn't burn down anyone's home. But he wanted to just emphasize. But because of the women and children, he said. His his kindness and mercy in him. That's how much he wanted to emphasize. So, this is a, a point to evaluate this, this, the situation of Muslims. And that's the Salah. And I'm talking of the main Salah. All five Salah are main. But the most important Salah of the week that got this time. I've always tried to evaluate and analyze and share with you because of my experience with the interfaith board and, in, and Jews and Christians. You know, you look on a Sunday morning, you see how Christians go to church, they get up early. Sometimes I wonder, Brother Zad, if Juma used to be 8 o'clock in the morning, we you have nobody praying Juma here. On a Sunday morning, they will all be fast asleep. Juma is 1.30 in the day. Christians get up, jacket and tie and suit, and they look all dressed and all smart, going to church 8 o'clock in the morning. Jews on a Friday evening, even though they work, and Friday is a busy money-making day for everybody. Everybody's like, thank God it's Friday, it's this and that and the other. But we go and check the synagogues on a Friday night, it's filled. And it's not about downplaying the situation of Muslims is about, yeah, I see everybody fighting and against Trump and you're against this and you're marching and you're protesting and you're begging politicians, could you pass this law? Could you do this? I have no problem with that, my brothers and sisters and those of you looking at this and who will see it on YouTube and Facebook, mashallah, who can do what you go ahead. You make your whatever appeal and your laws and with the politicians, mashallah. That's your rights in America, your democratic rights. But what about the rights of Allah? Do we fulfill the rights of Allah? You know you want Trump and America to fulfill your rights as Muslims. What about the rights of Allah? What Allah says? 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن وإلا أنتم إلا إلا أنتم مسلمون حتى ت you should do your duty to Allah يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون you know it's mind boggling sometimes what is Allah saying He's telling the believers, not just general men and women, do your duty to Allah and fulfill the rights of Allah. As you should fulfill the rights of Allah. And do not die except in submission, total submission to Allah. That's what it means. A lot of us think it just means don't die except as a Muslim. So we're all Muslims, so we just die. So listen, you want your rights as Muslim in America, you want no ban, you want all the airport free, open, free zone for everything for Muslims. Okay, Muslims got rights. But what about Allah's rights? Don't you know if we fulfill the rights of Allah? Allah has promised that he will give us everything. Allah has promised that he will give us everything and make everything easy for us. So don't miss my point. I'm not saying the politicians and the lawyers should not do what they have to do. What I'm saying, is there's a reason why we're facing these consequences. Because we are not fulfilling the rights of Allah. So Allah will try us and test us and put these tribulations and problems to wake us up. Sub total submission to Allah. What does Allah mean? Fulfill the rights of Allah as, as we are supposed to fulfill His rights. Not when we want to fulfill His rights. Not how we want to fulfill His rights. Not where we want to do it. When we want to do it. And total submission to Allah. Not half-baked. When we want to pray, we pray. If we don't feel to pray, we just don't feel to pray. We feel to eat halal, we eat halal. We don't feel to eat halal, we eat haram. Is that full to submission to Allah? Allah is saying, don't die except in total submission to Allah. Do we really understand that, my brothers and sisters? And that's a verse that most of the, the khatib quote in their khutbahs. As a reminder every Friday. That's a verse that the Prophet ﷺ used to recite according to many fuqaha, mufassirin, muhaddithin, commentators of Quran and hadith, Islamic jurists, that he would remind the people of this verse in every khutbah. Ya ayuhalladheena amana taqullah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa anta muslim. Do we, are we doing that? We do what we want. We pay our... We pray Salah how we want, when we want, not too totally devoted. That's an important problem. That's an important situation and that's a problem. And by not fulfilling and doing our duty to Allah the way Allah expects it, that could be the repercussion we're facing. And it's no ifs and buts about that. Because Allah has promised good and happiness for us in this world if we do our duty to Allah. You know, that's Salah. And I just wanted to use the example of the, the most important salah in the week. That you can't pray by yourself. Zakat. You think the Muslims really pay zakat as they're supposed to? The way Allah expects them to pay, pay it? The amount that Allah expects them to pay, do you think they really pay it? Look, now is tax time. I'm sure a lot of people paying a lot of money on the side to a lot of accountants to see how they could keep some money home under their bed, in their pocket, when the government doesn't see. Yeah, you could rob Uncle Sam. IRS may not know what you do and how you do it. You can't do that to Allah. You don't think Allah knows what we have? In the bank, in this country, in that country, whichever country, whatever, however, it could be Brunei, it could be in... Cayman Islands, it could be in Trinidad, could be in London, could be in a... Whatever you have and wherever we have it, Allah knows. You can't hide it from Allah. You can hide it from the American government. You can hide it from the government of the country you live in. But Allah knows. He knows. 
And we always remember, what does zakat mean? Zakat means charity? No. Zakat is interpreted as charity. And we're just touching the five pillars, you know, my brothers and sisters. Basic, basic, basic. Basic Islam. Why we are facing all these problems in the world? In America, let's get right here. And I want to remind myself, and I repeat this verse every week as possible, bathing the law. I remind myself. And remind, and by reminding the believers' benefit. It's a sad situation. It's really sad. Allah knows what we have, where we have it, and how much we have. And why do you think the Prophet Wasallam says on the Day of Judgment, this serpent will wrap around our neck, a big fat serpent, with so much venom, you know what's venom? Poison. And we'll put it in our mouth and say, I am your zakat that you did not pay. Oh, you don't realize the Prophet, وسلم, the man, Rahmatullah Alameen, received revelations from Allah. He knew the consequences of the people. They've, are we waiting for that day? Are we waiting for that day? Ah. When we'll have some friends in the grave who will be snakes? Some of us got snakes with us as friends in this world. So maybe we won't have a problem down there. Hmm? That's a sad thing. That's what women, sisters. What about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying the jewelry that you wear in your hands? And I'm just reminding, you know, everybody's talking about Fox and CNN and what everything is against Trump. Trump, mashallah, Trump got to do what he has to do. His time will come, his time will go. And we all put in like everything happening is on one man. Why don't we look at our own deeds and think it's because of us not doing the right thing that Allah has caused us to have a ruler that will be a problem to us. You do you know the Prophet Wasallam said, Allah appoints leaders to people based on their, based on their lifestyle and what he thinks is best and fit for, for them. Brother Azada is a serious thing. Based on what they do, that's the kind of leaders you get. Allah wants to wake us up. Mm -hmm. Think about it. The, prof, the ladies, the bangles, the, all those nice gold and diamond. Nothing is wrong. Wear it. It's permissible in Islam. Enjoy it. The only bad thing is some of you don't wear it home for your husband to see it so they could enjoy you and your jewelry. You wear it for other men to see in a wedding and when you're going in the mall and when you're going shopping. So stupid. Your beauty as a woman is for your husband, not for other men. Do you know that's a Jewish teaching? Do you know that's a Christian teaching? Do you know in Judaism, while we Muslims got a law that when a woman reaches the state, age of puberty, she must wear her hijab. Well, in some Jewish laws, and in the very little orthodox law, the Jews have a law that they are okay before they get married. But again, Jews used to get married as soon as they reach the age of puberty. If you check back the time of Maryam, wasalam, the mother of Jesus, peace be upon him, she was already matched to get married at the age of 14. People, they would have, she was, what I mean, they, people would have think of getting her married at that age. She was only 14. Why well, think Allah made her pregnant at the age of 14? She conceived the baby. Jibreel went to her. She was only 14. Do some maths. She was only 14. So in the Jewish Christian world, they had already talked about her being plans made for her to be hooked up. She was only 14. What? Not 40, 14. <laughs> so just before that, before you get into the age, and women used to get, get in the age of puberty, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So Jews got a law, Judaism, and it's because, you know, I do a lot of interviews on Al Hikmat TV. You got to go, you guys must go check out Al Hikmat TV, Google Interfaith Views and Issues. 
we talk to a lot of rabbis and priests. It's a very educational show on Al Hikmah TV. You could check it on Google on your phone. I learn a lot from them when I interview them and I talk to them beside my interfaith council meetings and lectures. So they have a law that when a woman gets married, the Orthodox Jews, she cannot show one grain of hair. A man is not, another man is not allowed to see one grain of her hair, a strange man. Jews got a law, Brother Abdul Salam. Not only Muslims. Jews in America. So that just shifts from the, the, the zakat thing. But I, was, I just wanted to remind the ladies now, you know, what happens is that sometimes we miss. Allah has no problem wearing jewelry, beautifying yourself, making yourself look nice, your nose and your toes and everything put together. You know, but it's for your husband. That is nothing un-Western or anti-Western. Orthodox Jews and Orthodox Christians practice that law. So much key. You're probably following the wrong American lifestyle, the wrong Western lifestyle, and we think we're following something really good. It's all about for your husband, that beauty. So if you wear the jewelry, for, that, no, it's not, jewelry isn't supposed to put in the bank. I'm not supposed to really put on only when you're going out so other men and women could see you. It's for your husband. And then on top of it now, you're not wearing it. That's the point I want to get at. You're not enjoying it all the time. Your husband not enjoying seeing you with it. Poor guy. Sorry for him. He bought it for you to wear so you could look beautiful for him. But you wear it for somebody else to see you look beautiful. Well, that's how smart he is. He might as well buy it for someone that will wear it. He will see them beautiful. And <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. You know, and then now on top of that, you don't wait, he doesn't enjoy it, he don't see you look more beautiful with it. And then on the day of judgment, you're going to be turned into a ball of fire. A ball of fire, all these bangles and jewelries that you don't pay your zakat on. Come on, that is corrupt, that is real trouble, brothers and sisters. You know, we don't, we don't take this Islam serious, are we? Mm. You're not enjoying it here, and we're not going to enjoy it up there. The Prophet وسلم, authentic hadith. Bukhari and Muslim. The jewelry that we have and we don't pay the zakat on will turn into bangles of fire. And Allah will make us wear it. That's not just going in hell, but we're in hell. Mm -hmm. So, my brothers and sisters, to conclude the first khutbah, we are in serious times, a lot of difficulties, a lot of seriousness, a lot of things happening around Muslims. But don't always be this person that blames someone else. Let's look into our own life. You know the Sahabas, the companions of the Prophet Wasallam, when they would face some difficulties at times, they would be advised by Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala look into your life and see what you're not doing right. See what of the Quran you're not obeying and see what sunnah the Prophet you're not practicing. And most of the times it was not about Quran for the Sahabas because they were Sahabas. Allah was pleased with them radiallahu ta'ala anhum. Allah was pleased with them. So it wasn't about not obeying Quran. Little simple sunnah they were not practicing. And then they really collect. Maybe I have this sunnah, the rasul, out of my life. Let me get it back. And then things start to roll. You see? Today we have the Quran out of our life. Yeah, we got it in our tongue. We can read it. We got it in the phone. I mean, you got it all over. Internet, computer, phone, everything. But the Prophet Sallallahu did say that a time will come when the Quran will reach only the throats of the people. The halak, your throat. What? The throat. Meaning, we will only read it, but we will not live it. I wonder if this is the time. You think, you do the homework. I wonder. We read Quran, we finish it in Ramadan. People boast of how many Quran they complete in Ramadan. 
But do we live by this Quran? Is it just a matter of recitation? Hmm? What the Prophet ﷺ meant by that? That we will not live it. We will be so engrossed in the love for materialistic things, in the competition of the dunya. Think about, you know, sometimes I'm amazed. I'm amazed. The Prophet Wasallam said, one of the signs of the day of judgment would be when people will compete with tall buildings. And you look into the Muslim world and you see them competing in tall buildings. And I'm like, oh, did you didn't read the hadith? Huh? You look at Saudi Arabia and Dubai and these, these guys who should be closest, they read the Arabic, they read the hadith. And they're the ones who are competing in the world to have the tallest buildings. I mean, they're smart. The hadith didn't say don't have tall buildings. So let's be very slick. <laughs> Got to know how to read them between the lines. So they are very clever. The hadith did not say don't have tall buildings. But it said one of the signs of the day of judgment is when people will compete with tall buildings. So it didn't say don't have tall buildings. I'm not telling you guys don't build tall buildings. If you have money, you build. You go build bigger than Trump also. And you may be president after. But what we want to get at is sometimes we get so connected with the tall buildings that we forget ourselves and forget our purpose of life. That's the point. It's so much into the competition of wealth and buildings and properties that we forget to do our duty to Allah. We forget to fulfill the rights of Allah. And Allah wants us to be such Muslims that if we die, we must die in total submission to Allah. Not that now we're sick, now we're old, money distributed to all the children and all the family and friends and what we didn't distribute, the wife took it or somebody else took it, divorced, gone, lost. And now we're wondering what to do. It may just be too late. I mean, Allah is most merciful and most forgiving. He forgives us as long as we got life. But you don't know if you may go to sleep and not get up. We don't know if we may go to sleep and not get up. We have many friends and relatives and people that we know that go to sleep and never get up. And we may not get the time to make tawbah, to ask for repentance. We may not get the time to do the things to purify. You know, last night, Brother Shamir gave a small little talk, and I like the dua. It's one of the most famous dua. What's one of the most famous dua? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhamana. Oh Allah, grant us the good in this world and the good in the hereafter. Interesting dua, eh? You know, the Prophet wasallam recommended that when you're making hajj, when you're making Tawaf around the Kaaba, you recite this dua. So powerful is this dua. Oh Allah, give us the good in this world and the good in the hereafter. So why did I say that, this dua? How does that fit in the package? Yeah, the package. The package is, we all enjoy this dua, eh? And we all asking for the good in this world. And yes, let's be very honest. There are a lot of us who mean sincerely that we want the good in the hereafter. There's no doubt about that. Right, Brother Salvador? Everybody wants a good in a hereafter. But here's the sad thing. The sad thing is, we're all working for the good in this world. We say we want the good in this world, and we want the good in the hereafter, but we're working only for the good in this world. How much work do we do for the good in the hereafter? Abai? How much work do we do? Listen, it's all about 24 hours business, going to work 8 to 4 or 8 to 12 or 12 to 12. We work, make sure our kids get all the degree. We make sure we get all the investment and the properties in this world. We do all the financial investment that we could do. We want to get all the diplomas and degree that we can get. We want to have the best property and the best car and the best everything. So here what? Rabbana atina fi dunya, give us the good in this world. And the akhirah, the hereafter. But hear what Allah, we can only work for this world. Eh? You got to give us the hereafter. We ain't doing no work for that. 
So we don't pray Juma on time. Some people miss Juma. We don't pray with five times daily Salah. Some of us don't give our Zakat. Some people have the money and the health and the wealth. They don't go for Hajj. So we're doing everything we're smart enough to invest. And then they come and say, Sheikh, this is just the good of this world that Allah has granted me. I'm like, yeah, but I see you put 24-7 into getting that. But what? You don't even put 24 seconds for the Akhirah. Huh? We don't even put 24 seconds for the Akhirah. We barely make Juma. Just do some figure, my brother. We, for our children, our, for everything, we make the effort for the dunya. The dua is about good in this world. Allah has no problem. Allah says, enjoy this dunya. I will give you the good in this dunya. But the unfortunate thing, my brothers and sisters, and I want to repeat it again. We make every possible effort to get the good in this world. We don't make the effort for the hereafter. How many of us read our Quran morning and evening? How many of us make sure we pray our five times salah? How many of us give the zakat we're supposed to give? How many of us care for the sick and the old and the poor? How many of us educate ourselves in Islam? It's a sad time. And just to connect why we're saying this, then that's why we probably face all these problems in America. That's why Allah sent a Trump. So you go on it, I'll give you the Trump. That's a Trump card. Mr. Trump is a Trump card for you. You're not fulfilling the rights of Allah. You're not doing your duty to Allah. You want America to fulfill your Muslim rights, but you're not fulfilling Allah's rights. Come on, does it make sense, my brothers and sisters? We fulfill the rights of Allah, and Allah will make the world serve us. Allah has created the sun to serve us. Allah has created the moon to serve us. We read these things in the Quran. You hear this all the time. Allah has created the stars, the fishes, the mountains, the whole world, the rain, the oceans, the air. The oxygen, the trees, all these bounties Allah have created to serve whom, my brothers and sisters? To serve human beings. You worship Allah and the creation serves you. That's how Allah created us. We do our duty to Allah and not only Trump, but Trump's father will do what he has to do for you too. Because God is in control. So don't worry about a Trump and a minister and a fine ministers and cabinet guys who fire themselves or if Trump doesn't fire them. Like they did with Flynn. Allah has a way of getting his things done. But you and I got to do our duty to Allah. You don't change the world. I mean, you and I don't change the world. Yes, the politicians again. The politicians. These guys, whoever, whatever, they got a job to do. Let them do it. You got a duty to pray to Allah. Do your duty to Allah. And if we fulfill the rights of Allah, haqqa to qati, as Allah expects us to fulfill His rights. That's what Allah is saying. As Allah expects us to fulfill His rights, Allah will make America and the politicians in America and the senators and the congressmen and the presidents to do things that will make the Muslim happy. That's how this world runs, my brothers and sisters. Uh -huh. And there's one point I want to mention, and then we'll go on the second khutbah and conclude briefly. We see that I'm already seen that I'm already in the first khutbah here. Our sisters, last but not least, I don't want to remind my sisters, and I want to remind my brothers that you could tell your wives and your mothers and your sisters and your daughters. Women have a major role to play in this Amilo Soleha. Uh -huh. Truly. You know, a father in a house, the father, generally, 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 the children may obey him and listen to him because they're afraid of him. <laughs> he may not pay for their nice iPhone. He may not pay for the car bill. He may not pay for the university degree. He may not pay for these things. So the father, the children may listen to him. Mm -hmm. They may obey what he says. But really and truly, children, generally speaking, follow their mothers. You follow what I'm saying? 
They follow their mothers. The kind of lifestyle a mother lives, that's the kind of thing children like to follow. They may scare the daddy, say pray. So they pray when daddy around. Mommy doesn't say pray, so they play when mommy around. Daddy around, they pray. Mommy around, they play. Because mommy doesn't pray. You see? So they obey and they may listen to the father. Again, because they're getting something. They're scared. No school, no degree, no car, no bicycle, no phone, nothing. But based on the mother's lifestyle, if she's not kind and she doesn't pray and she doesn't care about Islam and she doesn't read Quran, that's the kind of life these children will want to live. I don't need to do that maths for you. You do your own statistics in the world. Generally speaking, I'm not saying 99.9%. I'm generally, they got a lot of homes where the mothers are the religious ones, not the fathers. But we pray that Allah make everybody religious, inshallah. And dindar, submission to Allah. But sisters, and the Prophet وسلم, used to be concerned about the sisters. On Eid day, it is reported that on some Eids that he would go and give a special message to the ladies. Because women have a major role in this community. When it comes to the amal and the good deeds of children, the family, the society. That's why there's a famous saying that if you teach a man, you teach one man. Right? And if you teach a woman, what you do? You teach a whole village. Last night I was mentioning some of these points to the brothers and sisters in the zikr last night. Those brothers and sisters who make the time and the sacrifice to come. Again, I want to tell you, we have a nice spiritual evening every Thursday night, Maghrib to Isha. And we get into spiritual conversations. And I learn from it. I'm reminded by it. So my sisters, you got an important role. You know, last night I was telling the, the sisters and the brothers, I said, if you go to many masjids, many masjids, many masjids. Most masjids, I'm not saying all, most. What do you see when it, looks, when it comes to space for men and women to pray? You see a big area for men, and how much do you see for ladies? A little small area. You know, you know on, on five days, five times of the week, well, Darulum is a little exception, because we use the auditorium, so the ladies pray in the auditorium, so the auditorium is almost the size like here, so we're kind of equal. But on the five days normally, what do you think ladies pray here? Right in the back. A little corner. You see right where those brothers sit? One, two, three, four, five, or ten chairs there? That little corner. This whole big thing is open for men. Why that happens? Because women don't go to masjid to pray. So do you not have the space in the masjid for women to pray? And then you come and tell me, well, sheikh, women don't have to go to the masjid, you know. Say, so sister, we don't see you in the You know, women don't have to go to the masjid. We're exempted. Say, mashallah. Interesting, eh? Most masjids, you go check it out. Some masjids don't even have a place for ladies to pray. Those that got it smaller than men. Why? Because the time is a sign that women don't go to pray. It's just a little bit. Where in Quran and Hadith you see that it's forbidden for women to go to a masjid to pray? I just ask you. I would love to see the Hadith because I want to learn. I'm a student of the deen. Where? No verse in the Quran forbid women from going to a masjid. No Hadith the Prophet says women are not allowed to go to the masjid. Yes, the Prophet wasallam said... Yeah, because of the women consequences and pregnancy and nursing their children and babies and duties and etc. etc. If they pray at home, they get the same blessings as though they pray in the masjid. MashaAllah. So that's a concession. That's not a law that says you don't should not go to the masjid. Okay. So sisters, don't just strive on the concession and the exemption. Due to chores and responsibilities, that's an exemption and a, an opportunity or a concession you have. It's not a law. Last night, again, I was telling the sisters, and I know it's fresh in my mind, so I want to share this with you before we conclude the khutbah. The Prophet says in Hadith, and nowhere in the Quran again, it eh, speaks about women not going to masjid. 
When Allah says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amunu idha nuri alis salati min yawm al-jum'ah fasari la dhikr Allah. He says, O ye who believe, meaning women and children, women and men, when the call is proclaimed for prayer, you go to pray. It is not about, O oh, you men alone, this is your duty. Okay? Let's don't fool ourselves with the fiqh and the laws in Islam. The Prophet says, Women, if you want to fast and nafil fast, wives, and your husband tells you, do not fast a nafil. You know what's nafil, eh? not Ramadan fast. Because I don't want when Ramadan comes, a lot of women not fasting and they say their husbands told them don't fast. Because Sheikh Shafai said, husbands can stop their wives from fasting. The law is a husband can stop his wife from fasting in nafil fast. If the husband is home Sunday and his wife wants to fast Sunday, he says, listen, my dear wife, I'm home Sunday. I want you to put on your jewelry. I want you to look nice. I want you to look pretty. I want to spend this day with you. And she says, husband, I'm going to fast today. I don't care about you. The law is she has to not fast that day and be nice with her husband. Oh, yeah. The Prophet says he has the right to prohibit her from a nafil fast. Interesting, huh? But do you know, my brothers and sisters, the Prophet also said that a husband does not have the rights to prohibit his wife from going to the masjid. You go check the Bukhari and Muslim. He can stop her from a nafil fast. But even Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who tried to stop his wife from going to the masjid and she said, my Rasul never stopped me. You can't stop me, Mr. Umar radiallahu ta'ala. So there's no man who has that authority and power that they can do that because women are given that clear indication by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi Your husband cannot stop you from going to the masjid. And that's why the women don't go to the masjid. But listen, when it comes to space, you ask the people who build malls, when they build malls, do you think they build malls because of men who come to shop? Bigger malls, bigger shopping places. Masjid, small place for ladies. Shopping, big places for ladies. So where you see the most? In the malls. So the hadith... The exemption is not a go to mosque, so we practice that, our ladies. And brothers, you tell your wives and sisters and daughters that. And sisters, you give the dawah to the other sisters who don't come. We want to practice that we don't have to go to the masjid. But everything else we go and do. The, husband, the Prophet says that a husband can tell a wife whom she should allow in the house and where she should go and where she shouldn't go. And she needs to obey. Otherwise, you go take khulan, take a divorce and be your own woman. But he cannot stop. He can stop her from who comes in the house. And he can stop her from when she leaves the house. But two things he cannot stop her from. Two things. And you guys put this in your pipe and smoke it today. All you husbands and men and women. He cannot stop her from going to masjid. And he cannot stop her if she wants to give sadaqah and charity. Allahu Akbar. See this deen? And those are the two things you don't see us practicing. We practice everything else. The woman say, I ain't giving nothing. I'm going to buy the best refrigerator, the most jewelry, the best clothes. I'm going to shop down JCPenney until they shut it down. But charity, my husband got to give it. Not me, I don't have. And the prophet said, you could give it. And when you give it without asking him, he will also get blessings. Allahu Akbar. Everything else we do, but a little concession that not going to the masjid due to circumstances, we don't do. Given the charity, we don't do. But as women, and I want to remind my sisters that, come on, it's a serious time. You know, life is very short. Life is very short. If you don't come to the masjid and you don't pray to salon, you don't meet the communities, and brothers, I'm telling you that too, and you don't involve in the society and the community, my brothers and sisters, a time will come. You know, we live in a, a life already here in America. When your children get married and they go living in other countries and other states, I know what it leaves you with, what? You and your wife or you and your husband alone in a house. You know what that leads to as you get older and colder? You have nobody to keep your friends, maybe a bunch of other older and colder people who need some warm friends with them, not cold like you. All right. Your children live in far abroad. Your sons and daughters and grandchildren away. You alone. Then you get sick. Nobody in the masjid knows you. 
You quarreling with, with the masjid, nobody come to visit me. Why they will come to visit you? When you were healthy and strong, you were visiting the malls and you were enjoying yourself. You never came to the masjid. You didn't come for Juma. You didn't come for a class. You didn't come for a zikir. You didn't be part of this family, this ummah. When you get old and sick and you're in the hospital, you're expecting the masjid to come visit you? Come on, that is reality. You need to bond with the community. Sisters, I'm telling you that. Don't, you're going to stay old and home. You're going to get sick. Nobody will come to see you. Your children already in New York and Japan and China working with your grandchildren. Then your children are going to hire an aide or a companion to come stay with you. But our love and that warmth from the Muslim brotherhood and the sisterhood and the community is not there with you. Come connect now. Then when you die, you know it looks so embarrassing sometimes. I go to some janazah and they got five and six people for janazah. I'm like, this brother, nobody knew him. Oh Allah, stuck for Allah. It, it, you know, just the sign of janazah. The Prophet speaks about the quantity of people that pray your janazah is a sign of your jannah. Uh, your neighbors come in, your community praying for you. The many people that come for your janazah is a sign of your acceptance in Jannah because you built with the community. They knew you. They knew your good deeds. They knew your relation. Your connection to Allah connects you to the people. Your janazah. Some of us live a lifestyle when you die, nobody even know who you were or who you are. Sometimes people say, you know, brother so-and-so. I'm like, who is brother so Where is who? Is he in Pakistan? No, they say he lived right here. I said, oh, I thought he was living somewhere else. And then we come and we, we don't understand the reality, brothers and sisters. This is a reality they've got to face here. You guys think about it. You're getting older. You're getting sick. You're going to die. Nobody to keep your company when you go, get older home. Children are not there for you. They're all over the place. Same seed you planted. They're gone. They branched out. Mashallah, we wish them all the best. It's your masjid and your jamaat and your community. All right? You get sick, nobody to visit you in the hospital but yourself. And you die and nobody to pray janazah. So last but not least, I conclude with a hadith. Prophet sallallahu said, Make use of five things before five. What? Five things before five. We'll do a synopsis of this whole khutbah today, Allah. Make use of your youth before you get old. Youth before you get old. And the whole khutbah we spoke about, you could know how to use your youth into that. Make use of your wealth before you get poor. Make use of your health before you get sick. Make use of when you, have, when you are farig, when you have free time. Put good use to it. Before you get occupied and you don't have time, you may just get older. You got so many, so many things, time to visit doctors and nurses in the hospital, you have no time to come back to pray again. When you could have drive and you had a motor car and you had the fanciest car in town and you could have drive yourself to the masjid, you can't. Now you reach old, you're waiting for someone and say, brother, I don't see you in the masjid, I see you for eat. How is everything? I don't need a ride to come to the masjid, I can't drive anymore. But when you could have drive, you never went masjid, brother. You were in, where is the, um, the club up there? Hard rock. You're getting soft in hard rock. Hard rock softening you up. Yeah. Now you get old, you're looking for an excuse. Someone has to give you a ride to the masjid. No children here to bring you. Do you know someone who could pick me up? But when you were young, you didn't make the effort, brother. Sister, you could go to all the shopping malls, drop children morning and evening to school. Can't bring them to masjid. Uh, and then last, the fifth thing that Allah says, the Prophet says, Make use of your haya, your life, before mouth, before death. I, I really got to conclude. The second khutbah, I'm just going to read Arabic and done, inshallah, because I was just on a roll, bi'idhnillah. Because when I think of the condition of the Muslims and the problems on the Muslims, I know the solution is not in Congress and with the senators. The solution is with us, do, our duty to Allah. And Allah will relieve us from the problems and difficulties we face around. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May he guide us. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> 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 <coughs>
Alhamdulillahi na'hamaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'afiruhu wa nu'minu bihi wa natawakkalu alayhi wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina may yahdihillahu falamudillala wa may yudlilhu falahadiyala wa nashharu an la ilaha illallahu wahdahu la sharika la wa nashharu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhab an-nar. Allahumma rabbana taqabbal minna innaka antas samiul alim wa tub alayna innaka antat tawwabur rahim. Inna Allahu malaikatuhu yusalluna 'alan nabiy. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu 'alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allahumma salli 'ala sayidina Maulana Muhammad wa 'ala ali Muhammadin bi 'adadi man salla wa sallam. Allahumma salli 'ala sayidina Maulana Muhammad wa 'ala ali Muhammadin bi 'adadi man qa'ada wa qam. وصلي على جميع الانبياء والمرسلين وعلى كل ملائكتك المقربين وعلى عباد الله الصالحين برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين عباد الله ان الله يعمر بالعدل والاحسان وايتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولا ذكر الله تعالى اعلى واعلى وعز وجل الحمد لله اكبر الله اكبر وكم الصلاه